Hey, could we have a, 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 another word uh, just b between the two of us um, um, with you, Carl, obviously, but um, mm. about opera. I mean, why Bach didn't write an opera? My gut feeling is that Bach, um, as a 17, 18 year old, uh, went to the Hamburg Opera in the Goose Market, the Gemse Markt, and probably heard an opera by Kaiser, who was the resident musical um, genius there, and maybe witnessed, I don't know, conflict or, or anyway, typical operatic um, controversy that, that happens in the mechanics of putting on a show and thought, this is not for me. But th that wasn't the main thing. I think the, the, the overriding thing with Bach is I'm a servant of the church and I will write church music, but I'm au fait, I, my goodness, am I au fait with all the musical genres that have been composed. Um, I know Telemann, I know what he's up to. Um, he may not have heard any or seen any of Handel's operas, but uh, he will have heard of them. Oh. And I think it's perfectly possible to put together an opera, an ersatz opera, from certain cantata movements of, of, of Bach's and create a narrative which would be just as good, <laughs> just yeah. as good as an opera. I, I, I tried that the next year. Will you, say, will you be undertaking that for next year? <laughs> I don't know, no, but it, 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 um, it's something that has been in my mind for some while. You could, you, you know, it, it's called uh, Der Streit zwischen Max und Moritz, the, 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 <laughs> the, the, the fight between Max and Moritz, who would be like the German characters. And, you know, it, it's quite, it's all based on the rivalry between the two Dukes of Mantua, uh, not of Mantua, of, of, of Weimar, the, um, the, 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 the uncle and his nephew and fighting over musicians and what they get up to. This is great. I think you should definitely do that. <laughs> uh, where, just, where do you stand on things like the coffee cantata? I mean, uh... Well, I think the coffee cantata is good fun, but I, I, yeah. I think it's slightly self-conscious. And I think Bach had this sort of um, moment, um, it might have been a mid midlife crisis, and God knows what, when he, he, having done two complete cycles of cantatas by 1726, he felt he was not being appreciated or the conflicts with the church was were too much for him. And he thought, to hell with it. I want to make music and just as I did in Curtin. So I'll get my family around me and I've got a Collegium Musicum, which Telemann is no longer there to, to conduct. So I will do deal with it. And he had great fun doing it. And the coffee cantata came out of that. Um, and, and it was a, a, a divertissement. Each of you has written a book on one of the composers we've been discussing today. You've both been experts in their music uh, for decades, but both books are really fairly recent. Uh, John Elliott's Your Bach book came out, I think, late in 2013. Jane's Handel book came out in 2018. And of course, there are many, many books about each composer. What made you decide to write your own? There were two triggers to, 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 to to, to uh, induce me or to encourage me to write the book. Number one was uh, the presence of Bach in my childhood, um, a divided presence, because on the one hand, there was a physical presence of him, uh, his portrait um, on the wall. And on the other hand was my learning as a treble, um, the Brandenburg concertos and a, but above all, 
um, the motets, the six motets, which are prodigious pieces. And I find it very difficult to reconcile the two because on the one hand, there was this stern, forbidding character that um, seemed to be staring down at me and, and chastising me for not singing his music as well as I could. And on the other hand, there was this incredibly buoyant, um, life-enhancing music that I was learning. Um, and the portrait arrived, I mean, what the heck was it doing in, in, in a house, in a, in, a, in, a, in a farmhouse in Dorset, in southwest England? And the reason is that um, a German refugee who, who was a friend of my father's, um, uh, he was uh, partly Jewish, and he fled Germany just before the uh, Anschluss in 1937 and um, bicycled to England. Um, and he always told us that he was bringing the Bach portrait, that he had brought the Bach portrait with him. Um, that's not quite true. He asked his mother to ship it um, once he'd arrived. And because he knew he was going to be interned when the war happened, he asked my father, would he look after this portrait for the duration of the war? And my father was delighted to do so and hang it on um, the landing at the top of the staircase in the house. So I passed it every day uh, 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 from the time I could toddle. Um, but the, the main reason, the main impetus came from the experience of conducting all the Bach cantatas in a single year, in the year 2000, and keeping a journal. I mean, I, I really was quite um, uh, scrupulous about writing down my impressions of each cantata um, as they came up uh, Sunday after Sunday. I mean, the rhythm of the week was, was, was arduous to say the least because on Monday, uh, we would be coming back from the previous weekend's cantata and we'd be starting on a Tuesday morning uh, with rehearsing for the next week's cantata. And sometimes the cantatas came thick and fast. I mean, Christmas, Easter, Whitson, they, they come in threes and fours and <laughs> you don't have time to breathe. And even though I'd, I'd, um, I'd, I'd performed, I think about 24 cantatas at Bach before the cantata pilgrimage, there were 200 really to, to master. So that, you know, one would get back and one would still have the cantata ringing in one's ears that one had done the night before, or three cantatas that you'd done the night before, and you'd be traveling back, having negotiated, you know, the, the, all the, 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 the enormously long corridors in Frankfurt airport before you got back to London. And then you'd have to learn the cantatas again or refresh your memory of the cantatas for the coming week. And that, thank goodness I did keep my diary um, uh, for those cantatas because um, it was such an enriching experience. I mean, to be able to trace Bach's um, mental processes, creative processes, um, as they are allied to the unfolding of the church year, and you realize how he adjusted his, his musical um, creative force according to the liturgical occasion, but also the time of year, the season, the seasonal. Um, cycle um, and also how each of the cycles that completed the first two cycles um, are um, not finite in themselves but they, they do have an inner logic particularly the second cycle which are all based on chorale tunes um, and so you feel enriched by the cantatas you've just been performing and they will have an influence on the next batch of cantatas that you're doing the next week and that got me interested um, in, in seeing, well, what, what, what motivated him? And then I, I found myself perplexed by the fact that um, there is no evidence as to how they were received and how he was so motivated, so um, determined to do this, a, a feeling of obligation, um, despite all the constraints and all the opposition, it, it's just a phenomenal achievement and, and that needs explaining. And that is a unique aspect of your book. You and I had a chance to talk a few years ago when it was brand new. Most of your book is just regards uh, the choral music of Bach as your basis. Well, yeah, I've been criticized for doing so. Why didn't you do with the organ music? Why didn't you do with the keyboard music? Why didn't you do that? Because that's not the music right. I know best. I, the, the music I know best is the stuff that I've sung uh, or conducted, and that's the choral music. And that's a pretty good chunk. Indeed. Ms. Glover. Your decision to uh, write a book about Handel after your book about Mozart and his women a few years ago. Yes, it was a. It, somebody asked me. They asked me to do it, and uh, I, I, yeah, there are so many good books about Handel already, and um, uh, as there were about Mozart, of course, and um, and I thought, do I really have something to say about Mozart about Handel? 
but of course, and, and of course, all my research took me through very familiar territory uh, where everybody else had trodden. And I don't think I, I, I turned up anything new, but I think what one does when one opts to write from some angle or other is that you shine your, your arc light on the territory from a particular, your own particular angle and therefore it looks a little bit different. I mean, you, and so my angle really was was in a little bit like John Elliot looking at the, 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 the cantatas and following him through those in the course of a year. I was actually looking at the way by Handel's theatrical life in London unfolded from season to season and how, as he put his seasons together, people came and went and, and it was not just what he was composing and, and, but actually how he ran a company and how he brilliant businessman that he was, uh, managed to keep uh, keep this company afloat and, uh, and so on and, and, and look after his singers and, and, and write according to the singers he had. And I, mean, I learned a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount doing the book. Um, it also took me a very long time. <laughs> My God, it took me 10 years to write that one too. And uh, I missed deadline after deadline after deadline. And uh, um, because of course one had so much else to do. And uh, uh, I, and because he lived so damn long and wrote so much. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, and you know, I remember one summer I, I th I'd, I'd written a lot about, uh, about Giulio Cesare and that sort of thing. And I thought, this, I've really got on with it. I'm really getting on with it now. And I, I'm still only in 1723, you know, and he lived until 1759. That's such a long way to go. But um, uh, I, I'm so glad I did because uh, although it was often, it was sort of hung over me and was very overwhelming actually at times. Um, uh, I'm glad I've done it and I, I love him all the more. Yeah. Did you find out anything surprising? I mean, you've dealt, both of you have conducted his music, each music for decades. It must have found something that surprised you along the way. I was very lucky to, to be in very close contact with the researchers at the Bach Archive in, in Leipzig, where, where there are a couple of really good sleuths, I mean, musical sleuths, who, who come up with extra, extraordinary documents, again, completely by chance. I mean, you have to look in the wrong place in order to find the right document. It, it, it's not predictable. And, you know, so much of Bach's music has disappeared, um, used as fire lighters, God knows mm -hmm. what. Um, it, it, it's, it's unbelievable. But um, having close contact with researchers helped a great deal. Also going to Germany and working in the archives myself helped a lot. And, and trying to, to get to, to probe his antecedents, you know, not just that he came from a very famous family of musicians, but the conditions of life, the, you know, what they ate, what they drank, um, how, their, how their daily routine worked. I mean, um, and, and the different kind of liaisons that happened within the family. I mean, um, Bach obviously had a very, very good relationship with his first cousin once removed, Johann Christoph, who was the, um, the not his brother, but the organist of Eisenach. Um, who is a magnificent composer in his own right, and that his music has only come to light in the last 20, 30 years, because it was, it was part of the Bach archive, archive and um, during the war for safekeeping, it was shipped over to, to Kiev and, and has been recovered since. And he, uh, Johann Christoph Bach, is the sort of link between Heinrich Schütz, who is, who is a, another great favourite composer of mine, and Johann Sebastian Bach, um, a, a key person who uh, it's a conduit um, whereby the, the, the earlier Italian music, particularly that of Monteverdi, may have filtered into Germany through Schutz and then from Schutz uh, via Johann Christoph to, to Johann Sebastian Bach. That I found uh, really, really novel and, and exciting. Um, and, then, and then just finding out quite how temperamentally um, he, he, how he what kind of disposition he had both towards other composers, towards other musicians, towards his performers, towards his children. I mean, he was an overweening father to his children in a sense. I mean, he, so much so that, um, you know, when Wilhelm Friedemann, who was an incredibly talented, but slightly flaky character, when he went off to, 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 to try and get the job in, 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 in Dresden, 
um, Bach sort of slipped into his suitcase a composition of his, um, which, uh, yeah, was his, not your, and, and Wilhelm Friedemann's, just to make sure he got the job. <laughs> there's a very interesting um, new volume of, or re fairly recent volume of the Neue Bach Ausgabe, the, the collected works of, 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 of Bach, which is um, a kind of notebook um, of fugal entries and fugal um, uh, expositions um, by Wilhelm Friedemann and Johann Sebastian. And it's like the two of them are sitting in a cafe or in a Weinstube somewhere or other in Dresden. And uh, Wilhelm Friedemann starts off and he writes a fugue and, and, and Bach obviously thinks, well, yeah, but look, it's not going quite right and suggests an answer and then adjusts the fugue and so on. And um, it sort of chimes in with Carl Philipp Emanuel, his second son's um, uh, testimony, which said that whenever um, he went and heard a fugue being played on an organ, um, he would nudge his son and say, I know how it's going to go. The next phrase is going to go like this. This is going to be the counter subject. I mean, that type of musical uh, polymath uh, brain is just overwhelming to me. I, I just find that quite, quite staggering. Shane, anything, anything surprising? Well, uh, I mean, not, not surprising, but I think what I, what I did discover, as, as we talked about before in this conversation, is, is that I did feel I got to know Handel as a person much more than I had from merely conducting the music. Um, and, uh, you know, a, a lot sort of came out that we, we all know about his... Um, his his charitable side, for instance, uh, that 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 he left his you know his great connection with the Foundling Hospital and so on, and uh, um, which is just so wonderful. I mean, there is there is nothing more um, heartrending than um, vulnerable children, you know, and uh, and that that spoke to him in in a, in a big way. But he he supported so many charitable organisations. I mean, he effectively was one of the founders of what is now called Help Musicians. Um, oh, yeah. was called the Musicians Benevolent Fund before that, but when it started, it was the Society for Decayed Musicians. I'm glad they don't call it that anymore. <laughs> this is Evelyn Glenny's outfit, isn't it? It is now, yes. Yeah. Um, but, but that was effectively started by Handel, you know, when he, when he was shown uh, the sons of, of uh, two sons of, a, of somebody who used to play the oboe for him, who had died, and the sons were now destitute and sort of living rough in the Haymarket. And um, and and so he, you know, they had nothing to live on, and Handel was very um, involved in getting up this charity that would support uh, the the, uh, the families of, of of decayed musicians, of people who couldn't do it anymore. And I I love that side of him. You know, of course he had a temper, and he was um, he had high standards, um, and he had and you know, he had that fight with uh, with Matheson in his youth, and. Um, but I think there's a, there's a real warmth and humanity to him as a person, and uh, and that I loved getting to know, and 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 sort of really, you know, he had very good friends too. That's um, uh, and see, we get to know his friends very well. This wonderful woman called Mrs. Delaney, who actually had about three names because she kept getting married, but um, she was just so fond of him, and and I love the way she speaks about him, and uh, and so on, and so you you, you learn about other people about. It him through what other people say. She stood up for him, didn't she? Um, and when Semele flopped a bit because it was, it, you know, people were expecting a, a religious oratorio. In yeah, they got, a, they got a naughty comic opera. They basically. got a naughty comic opera with lots of sex in it. Yes. And, and her husband didn't like it or was too, thought, well, I mustn't go to that. And she stood up for him. I mean, yeah. Absolutely. And went it time and again. She always did. She was, she was a great supporter. Did you come across anything about the dreary details of everyday life that perhaps was surprising? Uh, someone mentioned food earlier. I, I think in the Bach archives, aren't there some receipts of Bach signing off for casks of ale or something? But what did they eat? Did Anna Magdalena cook? Did Handel have servants? I don't really know. Um, not servants. Anna Magdalena had to, to do everything. She had to, first of all, produce him children. Um, and secondly, feed him, and thirdly, um, help copying as, as well. I mean, it was a, it was a little family factory that was going on, as well as the the Thomas Schuler um, inmates, and he had to recruit the best of them. 
And I mean, that was an, another thing that I found absolutely fascinating is to, is to see how he managed to get all this material. In, in, this is an, in an age before emails, before photocopiers, before anything like that. Everything had to be copied out. Um, and how it worked, how did he get the music out to his key players and singers in time for the very little rehearsal they had before the performance, the one-off performance. And, and it, it <clears throat> functioned pretty well most of the time, but sometimes it was disastrous. And you can see, you can see how he's trying to get um, some of the family members, cousins, remote cousins and nephews and so on, involved in the copying business, and they make a complete mess of it. And you, you can see um, Bach having to correct his handwriting over the top of the, of the mess that's been made. I mean, there's one particular cousin who, who really can't even um, write in the viola clef or the tenor clef, and, 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 and Bach has to change it all. And, and, and he writes all over the top. It, 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 you could, it, it comes very vividly to life, this whole business of how um, the process of, of creating music and music copying for a performance um, uh, is yeah. a compl complex issue. This is also relevant to Handel because um, he, in, his, in the ground floor of his house in Brook Street in London, had a whole sort of um, uh, uh, team of copyists headed by uh, Johann uh, uh, Schmidt or Smith, as he was called, Johann Christoph Schmidt. Uh, he called, he anglicised his name as Handel later, um, who sort of really kept the whole machinery going of, 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 uh, of scores and parts. Uh, which all had to come, and indeed selling tickets for the for, for concerts in in Lenten seasons and so on. The 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 the, the home. He wasn't married, of course. He didn't have a, a wife and eighteen children, um, um, but he did have a, a a number of servants who looked after him. But basically, everything I think in Brook Street, where he lived, was was geared to. Um, turning out the music and getting the music in the right place at the right time. And if you look at some of the schedules for his, I mean, John Elliott, you have a, a, a very big schedule in that bar here, but I look at Handel's schedules sometimes for those Lenten seasons he did, and you look at the number of, of huge oratorios they're doing, and, and some of them are in um, Haymarket, some of them are in uh, Foundling Hospital, and you think they've, all these pieces have got to be rehearsed, and the music's got to be in the right place at the right time, and you know, this is just a huge operation, and basically it comes from Rook Street, you know, and we don't know enough about this, but it's something that, uh, that we should, and, and I, I, just, I just gasp when I look at the schedules. It's even worse than yours. <laughs> <laughs> Sincere thanks to Sir John Elliot Gardner and Jane Glover. I mean, getting Gardner and Glover and Bach and Handel into this last hour or so has been a delight for me, and we hope it has been for you listening and for the two of you as well. Thank you. Thank you. Great pleasure. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Carl. Thank you, Jane, too. Thank you, John Elliot. Mm -hmm.